action plan, open action. So this is the open yeah. action group, is that correct? Yes. So to, tonight we have the open action uh, group um, giving us a, a, a lecture, a talk on climate. The main presenters are Aid Mesliak and Joseph Yo. And um, I guess the main um, area of your topic is uh, carbon control. Uh, I, you mentioned last time that uh, you want to basically we want us we want to be at the place where we balance the carbon uh, emission and carbon use by plant plant form. And yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, so that's, that's basically right. where you that's the main kind of objective of your group. That's uh, right. We are working on uh, getting uh, carbon pricing as part right. of the reconciliation bill that's being worked on in Congress right now. Right, we're, we're the Assyrian uh, Democrats of the Bay Area. Um, and um, um, our group is, we are, very, we are a very new club. I can basically just give you a little bit of our background about Assyrians. We're Assyrians, the base of our language is Aramaic. <clears throat> we, are, we are one of the oldest civilization dating back to 2500 BC. Many of our ancestors and innovations are part of everyday life today. Some have even been credited to others. Romans were not the first to build aqueducts, nor the Greeks were to invent the Archimedes screw. Uh, they were both by Assyrians. For now, though, we, have, we face different kind of issues. Our relatively small population of about 4 million is literally scattered across the four corners of the world. As though that wasn't enough, we're adopted many ethno-religious Christian groups. As though that wasn't even enough to divide us, the most recent hyper-politics of misinformation has split us into two distinct half that each side finds it hard to see eye to eye with the other side. Our role in the Syrian Democrat of the Bay Area is to bring clarity and to the confusion created by the politicians and media. We're, we're not here to close the churches nor cancel Christmas. Who's, <laughs> who's pro-choice and who's pro-life is open to debate and climate change is not a hoax. We are here to learn and pass on knowledge and along the way bring recognition to our people, promote progressive values such as democracy, equality and social racial justice through education, participation, and advocacy. Empower Assyrian political voices, advance and protect interests of Assyrian Americans, inspire, inspire and promote grassroots participation in political process. Assist Assyrian Democrats who seek local political positions statewide and nationally. So, these are basically these are the these are the kind of the ideas behind our club, and we hope to build on those um, as we grow. So, the floor is yours. Thank you, Walter. Thanks for giving us the background of your organization. So, I'm going to go ahead and start our presentation. Can you see my screen? We can, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, Abe, um, if you could just share your PowerPoint application rather than your entire screen, that would be that would be easier for everyone to see. Oh, okay. I thought I did. Okay, let me stop sharing, and let me start sharing again. PowerPoint application. I have two of them. Okay, so. PowerPoint presenter view, right? Or PowerPoint slideshow. Let me try that again. Is that the same or better? That's better, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity for Joseph Bo and I to introduce Citizen Climate Lobby, ourselves, and present the challenges, solutions, of climate change and hope for the future. 
Citizen Climate Lobby, or CCL, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, grassroots climate change organization focused on national policies to address climate change. CCL has more than 425 chapters across the country and over 590 active chapters worldwide. CCL has four ways for volunteers like us to take action. Personal conviction. It provides a wealth of education about climate change so volunteers can make knowledgeable decisions on their own. Path to success. It has a clear roadmap for change. It is focused on building the political will for a national solution with global impact. Action opportunities. CCL has a playbook for building political will by meeting regularly and respectfully with our members of Congress, engaging media on both the local and national level and conducting outreach in our local communities. And support. CCL supports volunteers like us to work together in a collaborative, respectful, and nonpartisan way. Chapter meetings are a place to plan, rehearse, share stories, and encourage each other. There are many unprecedented efforts underway in Congress to pass climate legislation, and both Democrats and Republicans are in the process of introducing their plans, which is very exciting. But if there's ever going to be a successful climate solution, it needs to be supported by the American people. In order to garner their support, the solution must be understandable and make sense to regular people. Okay. So first, we, want, we just want to take a quick poll and see where you all are on climate change. One, meaning skeptical, three, meaning concerned, and five, meaning alarmed. Let me share that, right? Because uh, I have the Google form. Do you want me to unshare? Uh, no, no, I just shared it in chat so you, everybody can click on it. Okay, great. Uh, so we're not going to vote, Joseph. No, you guys can continue. I will, I will just share it in chat and the attendees can. Well, let's wait until we get the results so that we can compare uh, the results from this meeting with uh, the next chart which talks about what does America, Americans think. Okay, will that work? Yes, do you, do you want us to vote now on this form? Yeah, go ahead and vote. Uh, does everybody have, uh, can see the link? I'm good. Okay, so somebody is voting through chat. Is that what we're doing or are we going to use No, the... they can click on the form, hopefully. Let okay, me see so... if I can, unless it, there is a technical issue, let's see. So, uh, Sal Kuj, um, you see the link to the um, yeah, um, Google uh, Doc? I don't see the, I see, where's the link at? Uh, what section? Right in the chat, you don't see it in the chat? I don't no. see anything, no. Oh, maybe I didn't send it to all. Sorry about that, let me see. Oh, I just sent it to Mar. Okay, I have to do it again, sorry. Uh, managing uh, Google is a challenge. Okay, try it now. Okay. okay, great, thank you. So Niva and Sakud, uh, I, I see your numbers, but go ahead and enter them into the poll. Thank you. Done. Has everybody had a chance to vote? I have created the form, but I'm not sure I was able to vote. 
Uh, I see that uh, seven people are have voted. Do you want me to share the chart? Sure. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Let me stop sharing. Okay, wow, cool. So let's see what we have. Seven responses. And 71.4% are alarmed and 28.6% are concerned. And fortunately, nobody is skeptical. You got a good group, Tony. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you for doing that. Okay, let me, stop. let me stop sharing. This bit has become a challenging thing to <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Sorry, this, um, ah, right here. Okay, I stopped sharing. Okay. Okay, is, am I sharing properly, Joseph? Yes. Okay, so thank you for doing that poll. And so we know what our percentages are. We had 73% uh, alarmed and what was the number, 20, 20 some percent concerned. Yes. So a survey run by Yale University and George Mason University in April, 2020, with a sample size of 1,029 people, showed that 26% were alarmed, 28 concerned, 20 cautious, seven disengaged, 11 doubtful, and seven dismissive. Judging by the results of both the poll and the survey, we can agree that the consensus is that people are worried about climate change. Well, that is me just a few years ago actually a lot more than that. When I moved to California, I began to enjoy the beautiful outdoors by skiing, hiking, and backpacking. But as time went by, I noticed that California had more droughts and more smoggy air. People have been talking about fighting climate change for decades, but nothing dramatic enough has been done. Last year, we experienced more fires in California than ever before. And this year, this trend is continuing. This photo that seems to be an ever more familiar scene in California shows a backburn at Shaver Lake during the Creek Fire in 2020. And we are experiencing it closer to home. I remember when we had the fires in Northern California last year, the smoke from those fires began building up in the Bay Area. The smoke became so thick, we couldn't see the hills from our house in Fremont. We didn't leave the house for over a week. So I think I'm preaching to the choir here because you folks live in the Bay Area and you saw the same thing last year. This is a picture of myself and my friend just a few years ago, like Abe. And my story also starts with the California wildfires. I've always loved hiking and camping at a young age. However, I experienced wildfires firsthand last year. I went camping with my friends in the French Meadows Reservoir at the Tahoe National Forest in August of 2020. When we arrived, we were surrounded by smoky skies and thick air, and we did not understand why. We all thought it was a strange phenomenon of the woods until we started leaving the campgrounds and received concern messages from our parents. They all warned us of the fires that surrounded us, and on the drive home, all we could think about was how this could be and how climate change had accelerated these wildfires. The drive home, we spent hours looking at miles of burnt land and when we arrived home, the air was even worse. The hills nearby our homes were on fire as well, and we were afraid 
that we would lose our childhood and everything that we had known up until this point. These wildfires were the reason I started my journey on fighting climate change. <clears throat> I recycle, turn off the lights when I'm not using them, and I limit the amount of AC I use. I'm the type of person who sweats all year round, whether it be rain or shine, and sacrificing my AC has been a big thing in my life. Unfortunately, individual action is no longer enough. And I'm sure that you all take the same actions as I do. I just want to remind you what we're all up against. There are more record setting temperatures, both high and low, more extreme weather events, such as hurricanes, floods, wildfires, and heat waves. There are rising sea levels that displace both low-lying communities and ecosystems. There are more severe droughts that will drive up your water bill and there are increasing ocean temperatures and acidification. The ocean acidification has already destroyed 66% of the coral reef and many delicate ecosystems in the ocean. You might have noticed it yourself, but more and more people are demanding action on climate change. This is a picture of climate protests all around the world last year. Climate change is an issue that goes beyond country borders as well as political ones. The majority of Republicans under the age of 38 now believe that the government should be doing more to address climate change. You may be asking what exactly is doing more and what the government should be doing. Luckily, economists and scientists all around the world have already agreed on the most effective policy. Before I discuss which policy they agreed on, I just want to review what makes a good climate solution. First, a good climate solution must drive large scale change quickly. The magnitude of the solution must match the magnitude of the problem. And we must transform our trend line from adding carbon to reducing it in the atmosphere. A good climate solution must also use incentives to support choice. It must let people choose for themselves with incentives, especially because some people do not like the government telling them what to do. Next, a good climate solution must look out for those who can least afford rising energy costs. While we may be able to afford those energy costs, many low income and disadvantaged people are unable to, and we must form a solution that prevents them from suffering. A good climate solution must also be durable and stick around. This means that it needs enough support to prevent being overturned due to a change in political leadership. Most importantly, a good climate solution must be healthy for the planet and the economy. This means that in addition to reducing carbon emissions, the solution will also create jobs and strengthen our economy. So you may be asking, what solution is the best and meets these criteria? Well, Abe has the solution. Yes, Joseph, thank you. Thank you for asking this question. I'd like to introduce you to carbon pricing. Carbon pricing curbs carbon pollution by putting a real dollar cost on the negative consequences of climate change. Make generating carbon cost more and society will use less of it. It's simple economics. Carbon pricing works by charging emitters at the source for the tons of emissions of carbon dioxide for which they are responsible. CO2 is emitted largely through the combustion of fossil fuels used for electricity generation, industrial production, transportation, and use of energy in the residential and commercial buildings. As Joseph has mentioned, Economists widely agree that introducing a carbon price is the single most effective way for countries to reduce their emissions. And there's a lot of evidence that this would really work to decrease carbon emissions. This graph was created in 2019 
and is based on an independent study by Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy. It shows the expected amount of greenhouse gas emissions in the US from 2015 to 2030. The top blue line shows estimated emissions if existing policies stay in place. In other words, doing very little. The black line shows estimated emissions if a carbon fee was implemented in 2019, right here, at $15 per ton, and the fee increased at $10 per ton every year. Greenhouse gas emissions decline much more quickly and continue on a downward trend. Many companies have already implemented or are considering some form of carbon pricing. Some of those countries will charge carbon tariffs at the border on imported products. We need to be competitive with that. If the US implements our own carbon pricing, our exported product prices would already be adjusted for carbon usage and won't be subject to tariffs. Citizen climate lobbies solution for carbon pricing is called the Energy Innovation and in Carbon Act of 2021, HR 2307, or for short, Energy Innovation Act. As of today, 80 House representatives support HR 2307. There has been 132 municipal resolutions endorsing carbon fee and dividend policies. And there are over 2,400 statements of support and endorsements for the Energy Innovation Act from prominent community leaders. Maybe the Assyrian Democrats of the Bay Area will consider endorsing the Energy Innovation Act. How does it work? It will drive down America's carbon pollution and bring climate change under control while unleashing American technology innovation and ingenuity. It puts a fee on carbon at the source. It gives money back to households. And imported goods are subject to the same carbon fee at the border. What are the benefits? The plan is net zero by 2050. This policy will reduce Americans' carbon pollution by 50% by 2030. This is in line with President Biden's plan for fighting carbon pollution. This will put us on track to reach net zero by 2050. We've heard about net zero. What does it really mean? Net zero refers to achieving an overall balance between emissions produced and emissions taken out of the atmosphere. The next benefit is affordable clean energy. With this policy, the government makes fossil fuels more expensive and businesses compete to provide clean energy solutions. The resulting innovation will reduce our pollution fast and efficiently, leading to reliable and affordable clean energy. It saves lives. This policy will imp improve health and save an estimated 4.5 million American lives over the next 50 years by reducing pollution Americans breathe. And finally, it puts money in your pocket. This policy is affordable for ordinary Americans because it puts money in your pocket. The money collected from the fee 
is given as a monthly dividend or carbon cash back. It's a payment to every American to spend with no restrictions. Most low and middle income Americans will come out financially ahead or break even. Why am I so passionate about climate change in this organization? And I talked a little bit about it early on when I talked about myself. But I grew up after World War II and I've thought about the atrocities that were committed during the war. And you would think, what has this got to do with climate change? But I'll tell you, how could these atrocities have happened and why weren't they stopped? Countries and individuals were indifferent to the suffering of others during World War II. People thought that this wasn't their problem. And what can they do about it anyway? Or it was too big of a problem. We've seen all of these in the history. This is called the bystander syndrome. I'm sure you've heard of it. I think we are seeing the same responses with regard to solving climate change today. People are saying, it's not my problem somebody else's. It's not affecting me. Yeah, so what? I have to ration. There's some smoke in the air. Or it's too big of a problem. How can I do anything about it? Well, we cannot afford to be bystanders. Each one of us can make a difference. It's time for all of us to be upstanders. As someone who has suffered through the worst consequences of climate change, I have worked to do what I can to reverse its trajectory. I often help clean up trash in parks and rivers, remove non-native plants from parks, and join organizations that empower me with knowledge about climate change. I'm sure we've all heard of Greta Thunberg and we can learn something about her passion and her drive. We must challenge ourselves to speak up about climate change if we want it, something to happen. Many young people are doing the same things I'm doing to protect the environment, and we have learned from Greta. Young people all around the world, myself included, are starting to speak up about climate change and do whatever we can to save the earth. You may be wondering, what can you do? And you, you can start by learning about the Energy Innovation Act. You can try acting locally, by talking to your friends and neighbors about climate change. You can share what you know and ask them about their thoughts because we need to break the spiral of silence and help each other speak up and take action against climate change. You could also advocate for an effective national policy by calling your congressperson. Try and get your city council to endorse the Energy Innovation Act. Does the Assyrian Democratic Club agree that a national legislation is the key to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050? Well, here's a list of 10 California party organizations that have already endorsed HR 2307. And now we will proceed to the Q&A in case you guys have any questions. Thank you very much. I hope uh, this presentation from Joseph and I had brought up some thoughts on your side, and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, if you guys want to raise your hands, I kind of will uh, monitor, right, if you want to ask, ask questions. So could you, uh, I have a question myself. Let me raise my hand. Uh, Walter also, okay, Walter, go ahead. <clears throat> so the, the main kind of forum, the, the main kind of uh, thing that you run on is that to price, to put a cost on carbon. And so that will reduce it. Um, so 
having kind of seen how the industry operates, don't you think that there's going to be loopholes so that they can avoid and, and buy carbon from um, cell carbon or buy, buy kind of advantages from somewhere else? I mean, like right now, uh, you know, uh, Toyota or, or other car manufacturers, they still sell uh, gas guzzlers, but then on the side, they put a few electric cars and so they can get over that. So <clears throat> there, basically there's, there's a kind of knowledge that the two thirds of the global emission are linked to our homes. Wouldn't it be better to look at maybe, uh, so at home, the main energy we use is to heat, to cool. Uh, those are the main thing and, and use of water. So uh, why not link, why not use geothermal heating where it basically uses the earth temperature it's always cooler, uh, cooler in, in, uh, than the temperature outside in the summer and warmer in, in winter. So, and that's, that's forever there. Why not have uh, subsidize subsidized uh, geothermal heating, you know, rather than kind of fine or, or solar? Uh, you know, if you went to any uh, Greek islands 20, 20 years ago, everyone had a solar because free hot water. Who doesn't want free hot water? So. <laughs> Uh, you know, those are some of the things. And also, you know, what, what do you think about uh, AI and, and its basically role in, in the climate uh, in terms of plant? Because, I mean, the climate change comes in a lot of different forms. You know, as, as the planet shrinks, there's going to be more people coming to, you know, fewer places. And how, how are we going to feed everyone? Is AI is going to be, you know, uh, a critical kind of, help in, in, you know, growing more plants and also, you know, the farming, etc. So, yeah, that was my question. I'm going to um, start off and then I'm going to hand it over to Dave, if you're willing to answer the first questions that uh, Walter had. Well, I'm going to answer the technical one. I believe that mankind is a very resilient and with innovations and technology, we can do things that we would never imagine in, uh, that we can in the future. And yes, AI, artificial, artificial intelligence, will be a big factor in our ability to look at the problems and solve them quicker, faster, more efficiently. But uh, that is one solution out of hundreds of solutions that will be going on at the same time. We're not saying that carbon pricing is the only thing we should be doing. Of course, we should be doing everything we are doing now with all of the great organizations that are going on around the world. So Dave, uh, could you answer a question about other solutions that uh, Walter brought up? Yeah, um, so I think that one of the things that we want to do is uh, encourage innovation of all kinds. Some people think that we need a silver bullet. You may have heard that the only thing that's going to work is something they call silver buckshot. Everything, everything. Um, and so we need to encourage basic research. We need to encourage uh, technology development. The government can play a significant role. Significant role. And a lot of things that President Biden is talking about doing, will increase our innovating capability. What we want to do is incent businesses, private businesses and organizations to do their part uh, because they represent something like 60% of the economy. And the best way to incent them is to have all sectors of our economy besides our personal lives to move away from fossil fuels, to move away from fossil fuels and adopt clean energy technologies of all kinds. The problem, and I'll get to the point of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is, is an amazing tool because it's totally rational. It's totally rational. Our biggest problem isn't a gap in technology and clean energy gear. We could do it today without without as much innovation, if we could cut through people's emotion and irrationality. And 
So the barriers are really human, not technology. The only thing that we know that will push us in the right direction to incent innovation is putting a price on it. There's no amount of encouragement uh, and volunteerism that's gonna make a difference. But when people know that they have a choice in this economy between this product, which is a gas guzzling SUV and a, and a, and a, a vehicle that's been manufactured by Tesla, it becomes easier and easier to buy the Tesla. So um, I've kind of run on here, but the main problem we have is we lack political will. We have the technology. A lot of us, and I'm assuming a number of you are already taking steps to do something about uh, lowering the carbon footprint. But it's just like the COVID crisis. We were all trying to do things, but there was nothing at the national level to get us all pointed in the right direction. And that's what a, a carbon price or the bill that Abe is talking about will do for us. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Tony, I think you had your hand up. First. Yes. Uh, so I, I want to know about, uh, you talked about that HR, that reso um, was that it, uh, act in the, uh, in, in the Congress. Could you a bit, uh, tell us more about that? Who is pushing for it? How, what kind of support there is for it? Those kind of things. Well, again, I'm going to defer to Dave. I've been learning as much as I can about what's going on in Congress. Um, we're hearing almost every day when we go into meetings in our group that somebody is talking to somebody else in Congress about what part of carbon pricing is gonna be end up in the infrastructure bill. But um, maybe Dave, do you have uh, the latest and greatest on this and who at the right places are talking about it? Yeah. The Infrastructure bill is in two parts. There's a bipartisan bill, as you might know, that has gotten enough uh, Republican support in the Senate uh, to pass through Congress. Um, and that's being held up because um, Democrats um, want to put uh, human infrastructure, a lot of things, in including uh, education um, for, for young, young people, preschool education, family support, all kinds of things, but also climate. And this is part of a budget called budget reconciliation process. The problem is that you can't put everything into that bill and satisfy the Senate rules of reconciliation. And so what the Democrats, your party, our party is trying to look for, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, but what they're trying to look for is ways of offsetting and not creating a lot of debt, because that's what the Republicans are going to go after Democrats for. One thing that raises revenue is a carbon tax. It, if it goes up and it's very gradual, year by year it increases, it won't shock the economy. And in fact, uh, the economic analysis says it will do out just fine because it's incenting everybody across the whole economy for a, for a national good. And so the carbon tax itself is in consideration. Senator Whitehouse, um, a Senator back east who's well known for being uh, a climate activist in the Senate is pushing this bill. One of the reasons why a carbon tax is important is because other countries are starting to put carbon taxes in place themselves and they're gonna put a tariff on all US goods. Canada is one of them. Canada's rolling out a, a, a bill very much, or a, actually legislation they passed already that will put a carbon fee and then a tax credit, very similar. Europe is doing the same thing. In about three or four years, we're going to be hit by tariffs from the Europeans. That's going to affect our international trade. So there is real strong momentum that will get something through if we as citizens line up and support it. So it is very active. We're very hopeful. And we're looking for all kinds of organizations, including 
<laughs> members of democratic clubs like yours if you're interested in supporting it. This is, it will be a big deal. Thank you, Dave. Sargon, you have your hand up? Yes. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So first I want to declare that I don't believe that windmills cause cancer. So. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! So um, uh, I want to ask about actually the solar system. I know that's one, one thing. A um, couple of years ago, the salesman of those solar informed me that, uh, you know, the law will mandate now all, all the homes to be built with solar and everyone has to convert. I, I don't know how far that, that legislation went, but I did convert. And to my surprise, uh, even with putting a full, one of the best top uh, solar system that I was still getting uh, used of, of the regular utility company, their grid, they're calling it. And I'm now almost paying a little bit less to the utility company and and also paying for my my solar and I'm, that's one one problem I thought you know you know where where's how is the, how are we protected and if this is this plan is really working uh, to to convert all homes and and people to to use solar system in their homes. Well, all I can say I'm not sure who your company was. But we put in solar on, on our house two years ago. Uh, we got a, a certain percentage. I think it was like 15% back as, um, you know, through our taxes from the government, right? Right. Um, it costs a lot of money to put it on. But I look every day uh, at the, not every day, but I look at the meter and I see electricity going to PG&E. I'm producing more electricity than I use, but everybody's house is different. Uh, we don't have AC, uh, we don't have an electric car right now. And my wife who fought me about it, I shouldn't say that while she, hope she's not listening, um, uh, shows me the PG&E bill every month and says, look, $7. $12. So something is going on. I mean, I don't know, maybe you, you, you're, uh, uh, you know, the solar that you have is not big enough for the usage you're having. So it, every house is different. Every situation is different. But I, not to, know, I, I mean, I'm not uh, like I've, I've doing, I've been fighting with this over for two years with them. But my, my, <laughs> my question was more, is it true that it's gonna they, the government will mandate that all the homes will be like using solar instead of regular electricity? So one more thing, if, if, unless uh, and Dave can answer, um, in Fremont, where I live, uh, you know I've been involved talking with the people at, at the city, uh, and there's a sustainability organization there. They mandate. I think I don't know if it started already. Any new business built in Fremont must have solar. But I have not heard anything about forcing individual residential people to put up solar. If anybody else knows better than that, please let me know. Oh. So it was one of the salespeople uh, kind of uh, scam. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna let's talk on the side. Maybe. Yeah, we, we should. We should. <laughs> who, who who is doing this to who? Okay. Thank you. It, it's um, if I could just sure. jump in. I put in solar back in uh, 2014, and um, and it, it it you need a reputable company. And it does cost a lot if you're not leasing it. And uh, I'm finally in the black, but over the years, um, our electricity bill has been zero and we've got a small return. So wow. it, it did do what it was supposed to do. Having said that, and this is just my personal feeling, it's not for everyone, it's not for everybody's home. Uh, it, it may be economic for a lot of reasons about the positioning of the house and your roof and right. so on. Exactly. And I think there's an excellent case that a mix of um, large industrial solar farms, which California is putting in in vast quantities, 
with a mix of affordable solar for people who can put it in and with subsidies for the economically disadvantaged is a good thing, but it's a kind of a mix. Um, there is a place you can go, it's called Cal ISO, Independent System, System Operator, and you can look up on Google and it'll show all the renewables, not the rooftop stuff because they don't track that, but this is the grid, the whole California grid. And just look at it on a, on a summer day or even this time, and you can see that solar coming online and it just drives all the fuel, fossil fuel completely out. It's just amazing. It's a standing, and I've been looking at this for maybe four or five years and you can see it getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it, it's just, and, and, and wind power. So uh, this combination could get us awfully close to being um, totally clean energy in California. There needs to be a change in the grid because the solar installations aren't where the dams are and not where the big fossil plants are. And so what uh, the Biden administration is putting through Congress in this reconciliation is to totally redesign our electric grid to support clean energy. And that's critical to everything we said tonight. Thank you, Dave. Tony, you had your- Just follow up. Uh, so, so that the uh, carbon, um... Tax bill is it uh, supported by partisan or is very party party line and bill? How is that? Is that really uh, so has support across the board from both parties or do we know or it's yeah I can answer this. But it's designed to have bipartisan support, uh, and the reason it does is from a conservative point of view, it's market based. It doesn't rely on heavy regulation. Everything that happens once you rate, put a price on carbon, it's always a choice. If you want or need to have a, uh, a, a diesel truck for your business and there's no electric one available, you can buy it. The government says you, doesn't say you can do it. It's, it's, it's revenue neutral. It pays for itself. It's the only bill where it doesn't create more government and more debt. On the other hand, the dividend comes back. It protects people who are disadvantaged. Something like 50 or 60% of Americans, even though the price of their gasoline is going up, even though it costs a little bit more to heat their home, they actually come out ahead. It's the rich and the wealthy who pay because they have the biggest carbon footprint of all. And so it's progressive. It is really actually progressive. It's not necessarily gonna solve economic dispar disparity, this bill, but it's what we call a just transition. It's not gonna harm the people that we need to protect in order to rid ourselves of fossil fuel. Also, I was very encouraged last Saturday, uh, CCL has a, monthly uh, presentation. And I listened to a Dr. Ray Ward. He's a Republican uh, state representative from Utah, yeah. very conservative. And I was amazed how he said that carbon pricing is a conservative uh, oriented policy. And he meant that because as a doctor, and not only just a doctor, as a conservative, if you create pollution in the air, you should pay for it. It was very clear to him. If you produce bad things in the air, you should pay for it. And the fact that the money is not being given to the government or the government spending any more money, he thinks it's a very conservative uh, approach to dealing with this and he totally supports it. He's leading a, a lot of other Republicans, uh, uh, colleagues that he knows uh, to, su to support this. So it is becoming more and more uh, across, across the aisle. To be, to be honest, the Republicans have gone completely crazy in a lot of ways, but those Republicans that <laughs> I look to the future, 
uh, when you talk to them privately, they say a lot of things different than they're saying publicly. Uh, and so right now, to be honest, it's the Democrats that are supporting carbon pricing. So we're waiting for the public and publicans to show up. Thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, follow-up questions or any other questions? Um, I don't see uh, hands up. Uh, were there questions in the chat at all? That, uh, there's a lot of uh, chat going on, mostly from Dave. <laughs> but uh, I like say I will save it and send it to everyone that are interested. So we don't. Okay. Great. Oh, Elbra uh, has a, a comment question. Elbra. Hi. Hi. I just have a question. Um, where are you in the process of your collecting endorsements? Um, and and what kind of a pool do you have? Um, you can actually go on the website. Uh, that I think is in the chat, and you can endorse the bill directly. It, it, even if um, your club is not going to do it, but you happen to be a small business owner or something, anybody can, any, any business uh, can do it, make an endorsement on the bill. But the process is, is pretty simple. You can write the endorsement letter to suit your club. In other words, the reasons why, uh, if you all agree, uh, that's something you would like to do. Um, what we'd like is, and what is needed, is to go on record uh, with, a, with, a, with a statement of endorsement. And I've worked with the Peninsula, Mid-Peninsula Democratic Club in that capacity. And I'm happy to help if you want to take that step. But we're not here necessarily. <laughs> It's primarily just to enlighten you. Very if you wanted to do it, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We're but here to help. Language. Yeah. It's not a form that we ask you to fill out. Walter. Yeah. <clears throat> so once you collected some money from carbon tax, do you? I mean, do you have like an agenda how that money should be spent? It's going back to the uh, households, just yeah. like um, a rebate. Wow. Wow. Well, just like with the, um, you know, we all got checks, right? Um, several times from the government, uh, you, you get checks or you pay through Social Security. Uh, there's lots of, the government yeah, is that's, already. That's not, I mean, that's not enough, is it? I mean, just to send checks. I mean, shouldn't there be incentives to convert to solar, to convert to other energy types? Oh, to the individual person that's getting the check? No, I mean, to, to, to see, so not right now, if you want to buy an electric car, you get $7,000 tax relief, which okay. isn't a lot because in, in real money is a lot less. Right. Um, but if somebody wanted to convert to maybe say geothermal or solar panels, I mean, that money should go as an incentive to make it cheaper, more affordable, so more people could have it. Sending a check to everyone to spend money in the uh, and the mall, I mean, that doesn't help. I mean, there should be a follow-up to the carbon tax, how that money should be spent. So we, we have incentives in the, in the state of California for a lot of these that come and they go. Um, not to say that incentives aren't bad uh, or, they, or that they are bad. But I'm talking about the money that you're gonna collect from the carbon tax, right? Because it's gonna be a lot of money. Yeah, so the question is who gets the money? And, right. and, and, and that is, there's, there's a number of proposals. And in fact, there's a couple of other bills in Congress um, aimed at a slightly different mix on who gets the money. Um, the, uh, there's, to be, there's not enough money to pay everybody to get an electric car, right? There's not enough. And so, the incentive is simply the rising, slow, steady, and predictable rising costs of carbon, carbon fuel. Right. And people will, so this is not something that's going to jump tomorrow. It starts out $15. 
I think, if, you know, you could go for 10 years and you raise the price of gas 80 cents. Well, we've seen 80 cents in our lifetime many times. In a week. But economists say yeah. if it goes up 80 cents in a very subtle way, it's going to shift everybody's thinking to go to electric. And like Dave said, there's going to be incentives continually from states. That's not going to go away. Right. So it's but the thing that we believe and experts believe is that if we're going to get rid of fossil fuels by 2050, which is almost what we have to do, all the analysis show you can't do it without a carbon tax. And there's one thing uh, that Joseph talked about that is really important. You start giving money regularly to the public and they start expecting that money. And then you have a change of government, change from, let's say, Democrat to Republican, and they want to change it, get rid of it. Guess what? The American public will not be very happy to lose that check. So that one of the benefits is a long-term approach to getting the American public to get used to this so that regardless if there's a change in our uh, government, that it is sustainable. If you were if you were writing a endorsement, you would you could say that we would like to see a mix of options. We're also interested in incentives. There's nothing wrong with incentives as far as as as, as supporting people and, and getting them along. And as these things move through Congress, as you all know, um, there's the legislative process. So incentives can be added in. So it's entirely appropriate. What I am saying that incentives by themselves have no chance, have no chance of getting us to where we need to be by 2050. But if you put a carbon tax in, that's predictable. Wall Street sees it, the automakers see it, the public sees it, business sees it, then you're on the way and you can add the incentives carefully in the right places to accelerate it. Nothing wrong with what you're suggesting. Thank you. Tony? Yes, uh, so my question is this model, do we know that in other countries has been implemented that, and how successful it has been? Well, I'm gonna I mean, just Europe jump in. And... I'm gonna jump in before Dave does. Mm -hmm. I saw something that shocked me. I don't know if it's Canada, yeah. or a northern uh, country in Europe, their amount of per ton of carbon they're going to be charging is like multiple times the $15 we're talking. I mean, I, I was just shocked. I, do you know which country has the highest charge, Dave? I think Sweden does at the, cur the current time. Um, but as I, as I said earlier, Canada and, and the European Union are all both, both of them are committed to a carbon tax, progressive carbon tax. Um, and they're gonna be putting a tariff on us because we don't have one. Now that's not the only thing they're going to do, but it's something. Um, and, you know, we have a price on carbon here, it's called cap and trade. It's less efficient. Uh, but it's a market-based solution um, that Arnold Schwarzenegger put into place and Democrats have supported it. In fact, we've celebrated. So putting a price on carbon isn't new. The thing about the bill of carbon fee and dividend, as it's called, is it's a super elegant, super simple. Most everybody can understand how it works. And it's super effective if we took this step. Thanks, Dave. OK, uh, any other questions? Um, Walter. So as far as the carbon tax, 
you may have kind of already mentioned it, but what are the evidence that it is actually working? Because I'm thinking about an industry which is already set up billions of dollars in industry. And, and so would it be cheaper for them just to pay the carbon tax or, and, and to kind of just abandon that and then go start all over again? I mean, some European countries, you know, you pay about two or three times the same you know, price of a gas per gallon and they still drive. So, I mean, do you have any kind of records of showing how carbon taxation has, has kind of had an effect? Yeah, it, it's been tried in uh, British Columbia and Canada, and it was almost a pilot for what they're rolling across all of Canada. And it has been quite successful. The only reason that the carbon tax, which got up to maybe uh, lower than $50, uh, 30 to $50 is they couldn't be out of step with the rest of Canada any more than we in California could do it and be out of step for the rest of the country. But it's popular, it works. All segments of business and the citizens in British Columbia basically like it. Thank you. Well, it's uh, after eight o'clock. Yeah, we're, you're, we're happy to stay stick around if you have any other questions. Uh, but uh, we're happy to also question. send. Um, may I ask a question? Yes, Cyrus? Yes. Uh, Abe, um, what was this in the news that uh, some, some right-wing um, lobbyist was talking about how carbon tax, or was it carbon trade or carbon tax was just a talking point for the things to postpone, basically to throw back, uh, you know, the, it's just the game that energy company, uh, the oil companies play. What was it? I don't have exactly the verbiage, but basically it was like, we know this is not gonna ever happen. It is- Okay, so I think, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I think it might be the thing that Dave and I and somebody else talked about a few months ago. There was a lobbyist, I think, that yes. was uh, supposedly a lobbyist for Exxon. Yes. But it turned out to be somebody else. And they got a recording. Uh, the CEO of Exxon said, there is no way that we're going to allow a carbon, uh, carbon pricing, even though they said publicly that they support it as well as other oil companies support it. Uh, Dave, you might want to ask Yes, and that. that was the whole point, right? That was the whole point that they talk the talk, but they're not going to ever go that far. Well, let's, let's find out. I don't know. I, I, I know because I used to sell software to Exxon and Chevron, all those companies, and the airlines, and the steel companies. And the software was meant to track air pollution as a result of the Clean Air Act. And um, I was fortunate enough to be in a room with our all together and somebody asked the, the big oil companies, well, what do you think about climate change? And they all looked at each other. <laughs> Who's gonna talk first? And then some guy from France and Total is a, is a company says, well, yeah, we believe in it. We think it's real. And they went around the room and finally um, all the American companies stood up and said, and these are executives from the company, we know what's happening. The last one to say anything was the guy from Exxon. And this was about the time, 2007, 2008, a guy you probably heard, his name is Rex Tillerson, had just become the CEO of the show. Yeah, Rex Tillerson, yeah. Yeah, Rex Tillerson. He says, I can tell you, we believe that our product is causing global warming. Why is that? Well, we, we look 20 years in advance. Our whole, you know, our stock is dependent on our reserves, our proven reserves and so on and so forth. We can see this is gonna be a problem, but we didn't do anything about it. In fact, we, and they're being sued for this now, you know, we supported misinformation like this guy that just talked. And we're not doing that anymore. He said, why are we saying this? 
Well, because our geophysicists are really smart people. And my geophysicists and my company are way smarter than your guys over there in Chevron. And they tell us they're going to leave the company and they're going to leave the whole field if you don't own up to the reality of climate change. That's why we know that the writing's on the wall. And they said, well, what somebody said, I think it was somebody from GN was saying, well, what do you think we should do about it? This is back in 2007. And they said, well, we should put a carbon tax on it. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting there watching about this. And, um, and they said, well, what, what, why, why, do you, why should we do that? And she says, well, first of all, if we don't put a tax on it, we're going to get regulated and we're going to hate it. We just aren't going to like it. And, you know, I've got a bunch of people, a whole division of my company devoted to paying our taxes. If we don't pay our taxes, we could be criminally liable. Yes. I'll just, if you put a carbon tax in, I'll just tell them to pay the tax. You know why? Because it's going to take a while for the American people to get off fossil fuels. And we're going to shift to gas. And they have. They bought a big gas company to give them more time. So as much as this sounds irrational to you, this is what I heard. And then he's, he went on and says, if you go look at our website, and you have to look pretty hard, you'll see that we support a carbon tax way back in 2007. <laughs> And then it turns out that Chevron has does the same thing and so on and so forth. So they're realists. Yes. They are realists. And so yeah. it is true that ExxonMobil has continued indirectly to push back on climate action through the American Petroleum Institute. And now the American Petroleum Institute is saying, well, yeah, we need a sort of market-based solution because they can see what's coming. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, all, all of industry, has said, you know, we need a market-based solution, which is code word for something like a carbon tax. Yeah, and, and you know what? I mean, one guy saying something is not a proof that it is all cooked and, you know, it, it is not real. I, I understand that. But it was just interesting that they made that point. <laughs> uh, the guy made that point that all, you know, carbon tax. Anyway, just since you yeah. guys were talking about this, uh, I just remembered that and wanted to see what, what's yeah, your opinion. It's, it's, Thanks. It's, Thanks. I don't want here. to take time more than you already guys have spent here. Uh, yeah. I'm all for everything that you guys say, green, everything, and solar and green. And oh, guy, that, that yeah, how stupid was Trump? All these things about windmills causing cancer. Uh, God, I'm happy that this is gone. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that, that you did point out, some of you said that, well, how can they oil companies cheat? Well, they can't cheat. And they've been reporting their production numbers for years and years and years by law mm -hmm. to the Energy Innovation Agency. You can go out and check and you can find out how much oil pumped by Chevron and so on. They have the numbers. The government has the numbers. They have to pay the tax because the tax is placed not on you at the gas pump, but them when they pump it out of the ground or they mine it or they take it off a tanker. So there's only like 4,000 points yeah. and you've got them all. So I, it's almost I impossible for them to cheat. The important thing is if we can win the midterms and make sure that we have the House and Senate. <laughs> Yeah, and then right. be able to do those things uh, all depends, all hinges on that midterm and next yeah. day. Yeah. Big deal, right? Yeah, it is a big deal. And thank you for the, uh, the Syrian Democrats to you know, work hard to make 2022 yep. good for us. But again, we are nonpartisan. <laughs> yeah, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Abe, uh, David. Uh, uh, Joseph and Lisa, thanks for attending our club and uh, giving us uh, information and uh, knowledge. I hope that we can um, have similar meetings in future. We're very kind of, I think our group is very committed to the climate. So um, 
thanks again. Thank you, for you guys. Warms our heart. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Now. Good evening. Bye. 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 Walter, are, are you saying a couple of things so that we can stop recording or you are done? I'm done. <laughs> I just want to say that, you know, this is uh, this was our first uh, public meeting. Uh, looks like there was good interest. Hopefully we'll have better turnout in future meetings. Um, just we have to spread the word out and kind of figure out how to do the format of these uh, Zoom meetings, right? So that more people can participate. Thank you again, everybody for attending. And please, the uh, people that watch this uh, video on YouTube, join our club or attend our uh, public events. There are something to learn from these events for sure. Thank you.